Uh, Kathy and I have been married 12 years, and uh, we have, in 12 years, we've managed to have uh, five adult children, and, uh, and they're married, and seven grandchildren, so, hey, we've been busy, we've been busy. Now, going into a, going into a second marriage, you go in with your eyes open, you know how good it can be. And you also know the depth of the pain that can be caused by the loss of a spouse. And to enter into that risk again for the joy that lies before us in our marriage, well, it's very much like it is with the Lord. We, we become aware of just the great joy before us as we enter into that tent of meeting that Peter has been take, taking us through with Moses, that is so much larger on the inside than the outside. So we come before the God of the universe, or I should say the God of the universe comes before us, and we get vertigo. It's just like this, what will be left of me? But yet, I cannot help but come. I'm drawn. Lord, help us to preach but not too long. I'm going to set my timer here. Um, well, here it is. There we go. Now we're safe. <laughs> so Peter's been taking us through the presence of God that was with Moses, with the new, newly emancipated children of Israel who had been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. They knew nothing but fear. Fear that Pharaoh, fear of the masters over them, could end your life at any moment. And Moses took the life of one of those tyrants for killing an Israeli slave, a Jewish slave, when Moses was 40. And Moses was afraid, so he went to the backside of the desert for 40 years, tending his father's sheep. Now, this is not your typical hero story. You're supposed to go from peasant to prince. Moses went from prince to peasant. And it was out there in the desert, day by day, watching the sheep, night by night, staring at the stars in heaven, that Moses' heart learned to be still. He learned to sit in that place of wordlessness and ponder the deep things of God. And when God revealed himself in a burning bush, it wasn't the bush that was the miracle. The miracle was Moses seeing beyond the fire and in hearing the presence of God. And the first response that all of us have when we experience the presence of God is fear. Hide me. I cannot look at the face of God and live. I want to see you, but not that much. I'll hide me in the cleft of the rock, and I'll look at your backside as you pass by, and that will be enough. When Moses would leave the camp and enter into the tent of meeting, everyone would stand at their door and worship God in fear. What's this presence going to do, this cloud by day and this pillar of fire by night? I want God's protection, but I don't want to draw too close. Moses, you go in. Over there, we'll watch from here. And that'll be enough for us. But for Joshua, he went in with Moses, and he would not leave the tent. Moses would come out and cover his face with a veil and go among the people. So what rhythms natural rhythms taught your soul to be still and experience the awareness and the presence of God. Perhaps it's hiking, perhaps it's gardening, perhaps it was holding a child, perhaps it was staring into the eyes of your beloved, perhaps it was worship or meditating upon the, the words of the Lord, or perhaps contemplation of silence and communing with the Lord spirit to spirit. 
what allows you to be still and know that he is God. And when we do that, being still and knowing he is God is no longer a command. It is the true desire of our hearts. And we will stop at nothing to pursue it. In 2 Corinthians 3, 3 to 6, we read, And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. What has the Lord written on your heart? In those times of silence, when you move beyond words, and you begin to discern the movement of the Spirit writing on your heart. What are the words the Lord has spoken over you? A fresh word, a new word, a word that has creative power to bring about, that's what it speaks, like let there be light. And the Lord writes upon your heart, let there be life, let there be love, let there be me. The Lord writes his very presence, engraves it, upon our soul. The letter of the law caused us to become self-aware. Like Adam and Eve, we clothe ourselves and hide. Like Moses, we write 10 commandments, and then we write many more commandments, and we write words about those commandments, and we become burdened, covered under a large weight trying to cover ourselves to hide from God. But the Spirit enters into the inner sanctuary and writes on us, not, not covering us from without, but lighting a presence within us, His very presence, His very holiness. Verse 7. Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end. Will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was once being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. The law coming to an end had a glory. It was a beautiful gift, a gift that taught us to recognize the character of God, to learn what is Godlike and what is not Godlike, to attune our hearts. That is a glory. And is a wonderful gift. But the greater glory is the very presence of God within us. And that is permanent. And it is not because of our grasp upon it, but because of God's grasp upon us, upholding us as our very ground of being, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. The law, this, not, the Spirit has written this upon our hearts. It has the creative force like let there be light, to let there be light within, the divine light of glory. Verse 12, since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses who had put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to, what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened for to this day, when we read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, 
A veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Have you ever read the Old Testament and became heavy of heart because of the image of God that came out of that reading? And you wondered, how is this God like Jesus? Well, there was a veil. We were seeing God through a veil. But when we see Christ, the veil is removed. On the road to Emmaus, in light of the resurrection, Jesus taught his disciples, took them through the Old Testament, and reinterpreted all the Old Testament in the light of his presence, in the light of his love, which is the revelation of the Father's love. Jesus is the exact representation of the Father in human form so that we would get it. We would get it. We would see God's character as God truly is on a scale that we can comprehend. Verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We don't transform ourselves. We are not empowered with knowledge to make, us, make ourselves in a, in a fashion that is pleasing to God. We are not, through our own knowledge, able to remove ourselves from the darkness of the false self. We are not, with our own with knowledge, able to illuminate our minds. We get trapped in our condemnations. We get trapped in our shoulds and ought tos. We get trapped in fear. But when we turn to the Lord and behold him, we see his glory. We enter into that inner sanctuary, past all the levels of our fault and shame and false self, and we behold the presence of the Lord there as he is. And in beholding him, transformation begins to happen. Moment by moment, day by day, year by year. We behold him again and again and are transformed. So let's look at that progression. We come when we begin in fear and we're given a law to cover our fear. But then a new thing is written upon our hearts not written with ink or upon tablets of stone, but the Spirit of God writes a letter, a a new word, a fresh word, a living word, a word with creative power upon our hearts. And the former law that was useful, it was a schoolmaster, it taught us to discern between ourselves, to discern between the world and the ways and love of God. When it's done its work, we take that work and we enter into the presence of God. It's like tuning an instrument. We need to tune the instrument, but at some point, we need to start playing the song with everybody else. Whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. Whenever Moses is read and we approach God going back into fear, back into how to appease his fear, how to appease what we view as an angry God, we return to putting a veil over our heart and we can no longer behold the Lord. But when we freshly turn to the Lord once again, we behold him as he is and we're being transformed into his glory. That's because the Lord is a living spirit. The Lord is a living presence. He didn't give us a way. He didn't give us a plan. He didn't give us a bunch of tools to which to improve ourselves or the right things to believe so that our faith would become efficacious, <laughs> would work. It's God working in us. It is God purifying our faith to become in alignment with the work he's doing, with what he's written on our hearts, whom he is calling into being. God is bringing it to pass from within. And beholding him, we are transformed into his glory. 
because we see him as he truly is. This is the creative power, the miraculous power of the love of God. When the Spirit of God begins to write on our hearts, our souls are no longer hearing the truths of God through secondhand stories. As wonderful as those stories are, they're secondhand. They're somebody else's story. Our true self, who we are as people created in the image and likeness of God, is no longer satisfied with experiencing signs and wonders and miracles of God externally through our body. That's why Jesus said it's a wicked and perverse generation that seeks for a sign, because you're trying to approach not the inner sanctuary, but you're trying to put your faith and trust in, your, in your, what you see, what you hear, what you can figure out and understand instead of turning and being attentive to the Spirit of God in your, in your presence, in the inner sanctuary. The Spirit cries within us to experience God heart to heart, life to life, spirit to spirit, beyond signs and wonders, beyond miracles, beyond flashy manifestations to know God as He is in that inner sanctuary. This is what we were made for. This is where we behold Him. The continual seeking of signs to replace spiritual counter is a perverse manifestation of the false self, a turning away the gift of faith that is rising up from within us by the Spirit and instead seeking the assurance and evidence of our physical senses. The natural man is dead to the things of God. And it can see all the miracles it wants, but it is not capable of believing, of beholding. That is the work of the Spirit within you. So take time to be still. Take time to regularly turn your heart to the Lord and behold Him. And the rest will follow. The transformation will follow. Your task is to be still and to behold. Through the law in the scriptures, we heard stories of what God was like behind the veil. In each moment that we turn to Christ, in each moment when we quiet our eyes and the ears of our bodies, in each moment that we die to the desires of the false self, trying to seize the life of God, and we allow the true self to simply receive the life of God, then what the Spirit of God has written on our hearts bursts forth a new creation. Let there be light, my light, my presence, burning within you, giving you my divine life, the eternal life that you would know God and Jesus Christ. And in seeing him as he is, we are transformed into his image. When we become still, we turn, and the Lord unveils our faces. And beholding the glory of the presence of the Lord, we are being transformed into his image from one degree of glory to another. But like the gathering of manna, the bread from heaven in the wilderness that fed the, the children of Israel's mortal bodies, turning to the Lord and beholding the glory is always a fresh act. In the moment. God is the bread of life. God is living water. In the incarnation of Christ, God breaks forth from eternity and into this present moment to be with you right where you are as you walk before the Lord in the land of the living. By the Spirit, eternity breaks forth from the seventh day and into the present moment and the next moment and the next moment and the next moment. And with the Spirit, we ride that wave of the eternal now. Like the sheep in the parable that Brett took us to last Sunday, we are ministering to the Lord without even knowing it. 
Lord, when were you hungry? When were you thirsty? When were you naked? When did I clothe you? And the Lord says, well, you were doing it all along. And as much as you've done to the least of these, my, my brothers, you've done it unto me. Each in our own little corner of the kingdom, a temporal act of kindness becomes impregnated with the eternal action of God. And it endures far past the moment and into the ages. Our small, our small temporal acts survive the test of time. They are eternal. We impregnate creation with the presence of God in a unique way. God who's already there, but we manifest his presence in a way that endures. We lose self-awareness and become more and more of the presence of God. God is eternal. God is beyond time. But God also enters into time. And God is love. And we experience that presence as love. God cannot come to an end, neither can God's love for you come to an end. God's love is at hand in every moment of time. In their resurrection, Jesus' human life was taken up into his divine life as the Son of God. Jesus is no longer limited to the limitations of his pre-resurrection mortality of being raised in one place, of being in one place at one time, living moment by moment. That was laid aside in order to be truly become human. But in the resurrection, Jesus takes his humanity, swallows it up in his divinity, actually fills it with his divinity, and he takes us with him. Humanity has been forever changed in the resurrection of Christ. Hell has been harrowed. It has been emptied. In the Orthodox Church, in the, for the resurrection, they saw Jesus rising from the grave. And he's reaching down, and he's pulling up Adam and Eve, representing all of humanity by their wrist, pulling them out of the grave to rise with him. It's a beautiful picture. He is risen. He has ascended and glorified. Jesus is a spiritual presence, a life-giving spirit and savior, the savior in residence to all people from all time, from the beginning of time to the end of time, and beyond time. Yeshua, God is salvation. God is always salvation. We are all, moment by moment, experiencing the salvation of God with our very existence. Apart from God, we, could, we would quite literally become nothing. Every second of your life, the love of God is giving you existence. And not only existence, but transformation from nothingness and into the very image of the Son of God, in whom we are one body, one spirit. Christ is making us one as our head with himself and all humanity whom he has drawn into himself. Yesterday's glory is no longer enough. It's passing away. Be still, turn, and behold the presence of the Lord and let him transform this moment in, with, and through you. God met us in our fear. And he spoke the only language we knew, fear. But he's taking us from fear to, like Moses, become a friend. And from becoming a friend, God is taking us into the very fire of his presence and transforming us into something that is unimaginably beautiful and glorious and pure, refined in fire, purified in the love of God. C.S. Lewis says this about the power of God's thoughts that transform. I read in a periodical the other day that the fundamental, fundamental thing is how we think of God. By God himself it is not. How God thinks of us is not only more important, but infinitely more important. Indeed, how we think of him is of no importance insofar as it is related to how he thinks of us. It is written that we shall stand before him, 
shall appear, shall be inspected. The promise of glory is the promise, almost incredible and only possible by the work of Christ. To be pleasing to God, to be, to be a real ingredient in the divine happiness, to be loved by God, not merely pitied, but delighted in as an artist delights in his work, or a father and a son, or a daughter. It seems impossible, a weight, of gl- a weight or burden of glory which our hearts can barely sustain, but it is so. It is the creative act of God. Let there be you, created in my image and likeness, transformed to the image of my Son. We don't transform ourselves into God's glory, and we certainly don't steal it. We don't fake it till we make it. We turn and behold the one who is glorious, and then beholding, we are transformed. If being transformed into glory is the work of the Spirit, what could possibly hold it back or slow it down? Not turning to the Lord and having the veil lifted, failing to be continually beholding the glory of the Lord. And why would we not turn to the the Lord and behold Him? We may have given in to a fear-based evangelism and discipleship, a map that teaches us that God's love and justice are in conflict with his love, and love must take a back seat to punishment. A.W. Tozier awful, offers this insightful statement, and I also wondered if it was the statement that C.S. Lewis was writing about. So the second most important thing about us, beyond what God thinks of us, is what comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us, What we believe God is like in the deep recesses of our being shapes the whole courses of our lives. My gut level, that right brain, working view of God, my being attentive to the character of God in the deep recesses of my being will determine whether I continually turn to him or continually turn away and hide. Until I let beholding the love of Christ transform me, There is a real fear that I need to keep God at a safe distance. Like the children of Israel standing at their tents while Moses went into the tent of meeting. We stay at a safe distance. If I turn to God, will I fall in love with what I see? What will God do to me if I turn and don't like what I see? Will that destroy what little faith I have and put me among the damned? In fear, we don't turn to behold God as he is in the spirit. Instead, we keep God at a safe distance by professing formulas of faith that put us on a solid transactional legal standing with God who redirects his retributive justice to Jesus. Close to God, but not too close. Truly, what we believe God is like in the deep recesses of our being will shape the whole course of our lives. but it will not frustrate our final destiny. God's creative act of communion with us, written in our hearts by the Spirit. God already knows what fears that hold you, the fears that hold you captive. Don't deny them. Bring them into the light. Confess them. Invite the Spirit to illuminate them with love and truth. Lord, in my flesh, I am afraid to look beyond the veil for the fear that I will not like what I see and that I might blaspheme you. I'm afraid that a part of me does not really believe you are all loving. I don't feel safe in your unveiled presence, Lord. Like the Israelites worshiping at the tent while Moses went into the tent of meeting, I want to stay at a safe distance from your consuming fire while Jesus goes into the Holy of Holies, into your presence. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help me to live in your presence in this moment 
at least as much of your presence as I can withstand. I need to hide from your face, but let me peek at your back after you pass by. All of our spiritual journeys start from behind a veil. We come to a higher power in fear and self-interest. Lord, save me. I need help. I need you. The only image, the only language we know is fear. Fear of the world, fear of ourselves, fear of our addictions, fear of the dark spiritual forces, fear of society, fear of tyrants. We become, we were captive to those whom we fear. So the Lord speaks to us in the language we know. And now that he has our attention, he begins to write upon our hearts with the language of love. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. But in 1 John we read, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Fear and self-interest served you well to turn to the Lord and cry for help. Do not become entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Yesterday's glory that began with fear will no longer be enough for where you are today. If you return to fear, you will run empty, grow tired, and burn out. And likely you lose your desire for the things of God and grow cold to the desire for the presence of God, presence of God burning within you. You may even grieve the Spirit. You may even wander far from God and into darkness. But take heart. In love, God will fire, follow you down every, excuse me, In love, God will follow you down your descent into darkness, knocking on the door of your heart the entire time, ever ready to enter in, deliver you from all that is not love, and fill you with all that is love, until nothing remains but he and you, you and him, and God is all in all. You don't need to figure all this out in your head. Its success is not dependent upon your understanding. What God thinks about you is infinitely more important than what you think God thinks about you. The Spirit is writing this and confirming this in your heart. Give it time. Turn not only your love, but your fears into prayers. And in time, your head will catch up. And you will cease to believe the unloving things you were taught to profess about God, but lack the things that lack the witness of the Spirit within you. But you were trying to do the right thing, doing the best with what you knew. What takes a lot of faith and courage to go against discipleship, it takes a lot of faith and courage to go against discipleship that begins and ends in fear and entrust ourselves to the loving presence of God. God is infallible, but your understanding of God's word and your understanding of what the Spirit is saying are not infallible. We fear getting it wrong and losing our salvation. The fate of your soul does not rest upon your understanding. The fate of your soul does not rest upon your theological prowess, but on the love of God, the thoughts of God, the faithfulness of God, the mercy of God, the justice of God, the power of God. God your Father, God your Savior, God your life-giving Spirit. What God says about you is infinitely, infinitely more important than what you say about God. Child, I call you by name. You are mine. Let it be. God has not given you a map or a formula, but a presence. God has not given you a rule book, but the Spirit of God perfecting you in love as you become aware of his presence and behold him. In your heart, you know that yesterday's glory is no longer enough, for that glory has changed and stretched and grown you. It can no longer, yesterday's glory can no longer fill 
this new tent of meeting. He's enlarged your tent. The fear of God that once drew you but now holds you back is, is not enough. Enter into the garden of your soul. Be still. Turn. Behold the presence of the Lord and let him transform this moment. Transform you in this moment. The Spirit in you, with you, and through you. The Lord will meet you where you are. Be present and walk with God where you are in this moment, together. Respond to those first steps of fear that turned you to cry out to God. Engage the discipleship of learning about God. Study hard. Let the, let the scriptures form and transform your thinking. And mature into a life full of purpose, doing things for God rather than for selfish desire. But at some point, the growth of that glory will no longer be enough. Your soul has outgrown its earlier models of God. Deep in your spirit, you are yearning for the fire of God, for the very presence of God that says, woe is me, I am undone. Lord, undo me and recreate me according to your love. You learn to behold God as he is, knowing it will consume all that is false in you, including all your too small maps and plans and laws to make the kingdom of God work for you. What if, what if God is truly one? What if God is truly love? What if God is salvation? What if God's love is the source of God's holiness? What if God's love is the source of God's justice? What if in love, holiness, and justice, God's desire to save all things from the death and destruction from all that is not love? There's one thing we can do that God cannot, and that is to not love. God cannot choose not to love. It flows out of who God is. It flows from between the members of the Trinity, the divine love, the divine communion. And God is drawing all of creation into this communion, into this love. He's delivering us all from the captivity of all that is not God. What lies on the other side of the veil? What will happen to me if I follow the presence of God, the presence of the Spirit into the fire, into the Holy of Holies, into the inner sanctuary, in the larger life that lies within? God is not asking you to build your life on blind faith, but on the faith of Christ who sees all things as they truly are. The eyes of faith see and give sure evidence far beyond the capacity of our mortal eyes. Faith touches the things of a deeper reality, the substance of the things not seen. As you turn and behold the presence of the Lord, you will begin to see the love of God through his spiritual eyes, to love God from within his pure heart. In the security empowered the love of Christ burning in your heart, you will continually surrender all that is not love to the one who is love, all that is not God to his consuming fire of love. You will be fully transformed in love until all that is truly to be feared, all that in which you once held faith, all that is not love, that you found your security, affection, and survival, and esteem. Until all is perfected in love, and God is all in all. Well, regardless of where you are in the spectrum of that journey, from fear, to friend, to fire, I bid you come to the table as you are. 
Engage authentically from where you are, not as you sh- where you should be, not where you could have been, not where you wish you were, but where you are with God in this moment. For this moment is where God is present with you. This moment is where you live. This is your tent of meeting. That wave of the eternal now. We turn to him again and behold him. Let Jesus lift the veil. You don't need to tear it apart. God will reveal himself in your inner sanctuary, in that holy place. You were made for love, not fear. You are being perfected in love, not fear. Yesterday, yesterday's glory is not enough for the transformation that is occurring in this present moment, in every present moment. Be still, turn, and behold the glory of the Lord. Behold the loving presence of the Lord in your midst. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it, he gave thanks. Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. As you eat of it, remember me. Be aware of me. I am present with you. I am not far off. And he took the cup. This is the blood of the covenant. A new covenant. My blood poured out for you. Everything about you that is not love, everything about you that is false, I have taken that into myself. I have consumed it with the fire of my love. My blood is life. The blue cups are juice, the brown cups are wine, both are blood, both are fire. Turn to the Lord in partaking of communion. Behold him. Behold his love for you and enter into the Holy of Holies. Come. So lay aside the voices and thought fragments that flatter you, control you, and condemn you, that keep you bound in fear. Attune your heart to what the Spirit has written upon you, my beloved, written in my blood, engraved on your heart with my wounds. I lift the veil, enter in. I lift the veil. Do not hide your eyes. I lift the veil. Do not cover yourself. I lift the veil. Turn to me. My eyes see nothing but the object of my love. You are my beloved. You are my bride. You are my body. The spirit and the bride say, come. Behold him. The rest will follow. Come, enter into my rest. For the one behind, the one living behind the veil, no amount of words are enough. No amount of fig leaves or clothing is enough. But the one who continuously encounters God, the presence of God beyond the veil, No words are necessary. No covering is necessary. The beloved knows, communes, spirit to spirit. When our eyes are open, we cover ourselves continually behind the veil and we hide. 
But when we turn to Christ and the veil is removed, we behold him as, we is, as he is. And we are closed with the overflowing presence of the Lord, radiant and beautiful in his light. Believe the gospel. And if you need help finding new ways to pray, to live in that reality, come see me. It's what we do every Sunday morning. Be filled. Be still. Behold him. Amen.